What transpired when Moshe and his wife reached the lodging place on the way to Egypt? In Sefer Shemoth, the beginning of Peregimel, Exodus, the beginning of chapter 3, Umoshe hayo ra'a af son yithro hothano ko hen Midian. Moshe had settled down in Midian. He had married the daughter, Sipora of this important and wealthy man and priest of Midian, Yithro. And Moshe was now also in charge of shepherding these very substantial flocks of his father-in-law. And he took these flocks by way of the desert or circumventing the desert. And he came to Horev, described here as Har HaElohim, the mountain of God. And we all are familiar with the vision and the experience that Moshe Rabbeinu had there, the burning bush, Hashem spoke to him and said to him as follows. In Pasuk Well, verse 6, Wayomer Onuchi Elohe Avicha, I am the God of your father, Elohe Avraham, Elohe Ishak, Elohe Yaakov, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Wayaster Moshe Pano, and Moshe hid his face, Kiyare Mehabit Eloha Elohim, because he was abashed to see, to look directly at this vision. Wayomer Adunai, and Hashem said to Moshe, Ro'o ra'ithi, et onni ammi ashaba misraim, I have seen, I am fully aware of the suffering of my people in Egypt, wa'atsa aqatham shamati mi pane nukhaso, and I hear their cries due to their taskmasters who beat them and mistreat them. Ki yodati et makhavo, I know their suffering. And now I am choosing you and I am sending you to save them, says Moshe, says Hashem rather to Moshe. And Moshe tries, surprisingly perhaps, to get out of this mission. Moshe replies, Wayomer Moshe and Elohim, me onochi, who am I? Ki alechel paro, to go to paro, this great king before whom the entire ancient world, the Near Eastern world, trembled. Who am I to go before him? <laughs> to bring the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim. This too is an important lesson that true leaders such as Moshe Rabbeinu do not seek their position of leadership. It is thrust upon them, it is forced upon them. And this too is a great lesson in terms of the necessary characteristics of Jewish leadership. And in Perek Dalet, chapter 4, Pasuk Yod Aleph, verse 11, we read, when Moshe complains and explains that I am not really capable of this task, Hashem said to him, Mi sam pe lo adam, who gives the power of speech to man? Or mi yasum ilem, who causes a person to be dumb without this faculty? Or heresh, or fiqah, or iwer, or deaf, or intelligent, or blind. Halo onochi adunai, I will, I am the one who grants all of these things, and I will give you the power and the ability to do this task. And then in Pasuk Yod Heth, verse 18, Ruyalech Moshe, Vayashar el Yether Hothano, Moshe went and spoke to his father-in-law, Yithro, Vayomelo elechana, I wish to go, Vayashuva elahai ashaba misraim, return, I wish to return to my brethren in Egypt, Vayar'eh, to see if they are still alive. Many years have passed since Moshe fled from Mitzrayim, from Egypt. 
Vayomar Yitro le Moshe lech le Shalom. And Yitro said to Moshe, go in peace. What do we understand from this? Moshe did not relate to Yitro what had, had transpired out in the areas of grazing out in the desert for the obvious reason that he would have been considered to have lost his mind. What do you mean? You heard a god, which god, speak to you and you saw a bush that refused to burn and you claim that this god t told you to go to Egypt, this great power, the greatest power in, in this part of the world and in the Near East at that time and you're going to speak to this Paro, this king of Egypt and simply tell him and convince him that he should allow all of his Hebrew sl slaves to leave. Have you lost your mind? What on earth are you talking about? Clearly you throw, apart from probably reaching the conclusion that Moshe had lost his mind, would have clearly endeavored to prevent Moshe from leaving. After all, he was married to his daughter, he had a son, he was in charge of his flocks. Why would he want him to leave? And of course, on such a ridiculous endeavor, on a, on a wild goose chase, that would almost certainly lead to his death. Clearly, Yithro would have wished to prevent Moshe from leaving Midian and going about such a task. And at this point, the Torah tells us, parenthetically, in Pasuk Yoteth, verse 19, Hashem spoke to Moshe in Midian. This is apparently after the vision, before he left for Egypt, because he was obviously very concerned and scared. Lech shuv Misraim, go and return to Egypt as I told you. Ki methu kol anashim, all those people who were searching, who were trying to apprehend you and kill you. All those people who were trying to end your life because of what you did in Egypt, all those people have died. So you should not fear. Clearly Moshe was concerned. And this is normal and natural. Moshe was a very great man. Yes, he was outstanding and unique. But he was nevertheless a human being. And he had good reason to be concerned. And so he was. And Moshe was told by Hashem, Nevertheless, go, and I'm telling you that you will be all right, and those people are no more. The next pasuk tells us, the next verse, He took his wife and his sons. This is the first time that we hear that Moshe Rabbeinu had another child, another son, a second son. And he placed them on donkeys. And began to journey towards, to return to Misraim, to Egypt. And Moshe took with him the, the staff that he had at that time, that, Moshe, that Hashem had given him and pointed out to him, and said, with this you shall do great things in Egypt. Just as it was clear that Moshe did not relate to Yithro, the true reason for his return, to Egypt. So it was with his wife. Clearly he did not tell her why he wanted to return to Egypt. And for the same reason, his wife would have thought that he was crazy. And she would have been petrified of what would happen to him if they were to return to Egypt. That he would certainly be put to death by Paro, by the king of Egypt. And therefore she would have done everything in her power to dissuade him. And then in Pasuk Kafbeth, Verse 22, And you shall say to Paro when you meet him, when you return, Thus says Hashem, The Jewish people are my firstborn son. In other words, I have a special relationship with these people. They are mine and they have a special purpose and I am claiming them. وَأُمَارْ إِلَيْخَ And I am saying to you, Paro, شَلَحَتْ بَنِي وَيَعْذَنِي Release my firstborn son, my people, 
so that they may serve me. And if you refuse to do this, If you refuse, I shall take the life of your firstborn son. What is curious about this pasuk, this verse, and the one that precedes it, which we did not read here, where Moshe is told by Hashem what he should say to Paro when he arrives in Mitzrayim, what is curious is that it is being related to Moshe at this point. He hasn't yet arrived in Mitzrayim. It would be more logical to hear these words spoken to, by Hashem to Moshe once he is in Mitzrayim, once he is back there in Egypt, and now he's about to confront Paro, and there he needs to be told what to say. But here he is just leaving Midian. He is just at the very beginning of his journey, and if you look on a map, you will readily see that we're talking about quite a journey. A journey probably of weeks, certainly of many days. So why is this being said to Moshe now? Also, we should note the stress placed on the concept of the firstborn son. Hashem says to Moshe, tell Paro that the Jewish people are my firstborn son, and if you do not release them, I will kill your firstborn son. And then we come across this very enigmatic episode with Moshe and his wife at the beginning of their journey from Midian to Misraim, from Midian to Egypt. They stopped, perhaps on the first or the second day of the journey, at a lodging place. Literally, and Hashem met him. And it seemed that he wished to kill him. The question is, whom did Hashem meet? And whom did he wish to kill? And why? Most of the Mefarshim of the commentators explain that it was Moshe who was, whose life was in danger. Then we read in Pasuk Kafhe, verse 25, Sipora Sor. Sipora took a very sharp stone, the kind that served as a knife. Vatikroth at Orlath and she circumcised her newborn son. And threw it at his feet. His apparently referring to Moshe. Which is a very enigmatic statement. Something to the effect that you are a, a husband of, of blood or possible bloodshed with regards to me and my family. Then it goes on to say, and then he relinquished him, or let go, or relented. Doesn't say exactly with reference to whom or to what. Az Amara, and then she said, the wife of Moshe, Sipora, Hathan Domim Lamuloth, the the bloody husband of the circumcision. A very enigmatic uh, episode. And the words of the Torah are very, very mysterious, as already mentioned. It is curious that Hashem spoke to Moshe and told him what he should say to Paro when Moshe had barely begun his journey. Furthermore, it is unusual, it is noteworthy, that Hashem mentions to Moshe the, the last of the ten plagues, that is to say, Makath Bechoroth, the killing of the firstborn of the Egyptians at the very outset, that which is at the very end of all these events that will come to pass. This is already mentioned to Moshe now, the death of the firstborn son. Harav Shadal, Harav Shemuel David Lutzato, Samuel David Lutzato, writes in his commentary, that this is, in fact, a kind of hint of what is about to happen. As we saw, as we mentioned before, Moshe Rabbeinu had a newborn son. How old was this son? It's difficult to know precisely, but it seems that Moshe did not circumcise this son 
on the eighth day, as was the custom among the Jewish people already from the time of Abraham. And the Shadal suggests that he did not do so due to the advice of his wife, either because of the Midianite and uh, also general Ishmaelite custom of circumcising at the age of 13, not at eight days, and also because of the travel that they were about, the journey they were about to undertake, and therefore would be dangerous perhaps to do so for the child. So Moshe was guilty of following his wi wife's advice. It's also clear that this journey could not be undertaken within days, within one week of, of his wife giving birth. Now, another point to note is that Moshe decided to take his wife and his sons, one of them very young, a newborn, on this journey, something that, Moshe, that Hashem did not tell him or instruct him to do. And we can ask ourselves, was this the right decision? Because as we said earlier, just as Yithro would certainly have endeavored to dissuade Moshe from any such journey and confronting Paro and taking upon himself this incredible and seemingly insane mission, surely, as we mentioned, surely his wife would have done the same. And his son, his older son, was already a boy who could certainly have said something and understood the danger involved. And they certainly would have tried to dissuade him from either traveling to Egypt or even having once arrived in Egypt, undertaking such a mission and, and confronting Paro. Hashem, therefore, hinted to Moshe by telling him at this point what he should say to Paro when he arrives, when he confronts Paro in Egypt, that he will kill his firstborn son if he refuses to do what he is instructed to do. Hashem was also telling Moshe Rabbeinu the very same thing. Hashem was also informing, hinting to Moshe that your firstborn son will also be killed if you do not fulfill this mission that I have entrusted to you. In other words, Moshe had no choice. This is what Hashem wanted him to understand. If Paro refuses, he will, his first son, born son will be killed. And if you refuse, if you allow yourself to be dissuaded, to be deflected from this task, from this mission, your firstborn son will be killed. And therefore we read, When they were at the sojourning place, at the very beginning of their journey, literally Hashem met him, and wished to kill him. Now this is again all very unclear and the meaning is open to interpretation. Harav Shaddal explains that the meaning is as follows. The firstborn son Gerashom of Moshe Rabbeinu was, became very ill and he was so ill that it seemed that he might die and that is what it refers to. Hashem met him, that is to say, Hashem caused this illness to come upon the firstborn son of Moshe, and he became very ill. And at this point, Moshe understood. He finally understood what Hashem had said to him and hinted to him. And therefore, he said at this point to his wife, Sipura, I, I know why my firstborn son is so sick and in fact may die. It is because, A, I have not circumcised my second son, the newborn son. I went beyond the eighth day, which I should not have done. I listened to you. And furthermore, I understand now that I should not be taking you on this journey at all. Because this is not something for you or for the children to witness or to be part of. You may wish to deter me, 
dissuade me, cause me to change my mind. And this cannot be allowed. And this was not what Hashem intended. And therefore, Sipura, having understood this, having heard this from Moshe, A, she circumcised immediately the, the son, the second son. And then we read, Wayiraf Mimenu, that the the child who was ill now ceased being so ill. His disease was no longer as severe and it began to improve almost immediately. And furthermore, we can understand and we should understand from here, says Harav Shadal that at this point Moshe Rabbeinu sent his wife and his children home back to Yitro, his father-in-law. And this explains very satisfactorily that which we find later in Parashat Yitro, in chapter 18, at the very beginning, Perak Yodahet. Yitro heard about the events of the Exodus and it says in the second verse, Pasuk Beth, Vayikah Yithro Hoten Moshe. Moshe's father in law Yithro took Eth Sipura, Eshet Moshe, his, Moshe's wife, Sipura, his daughter, Ahar Shiluheha, after she had been sent away. When did we see, when did we hear that Sipura was sent away? Furthermore, we did not hear anything about Moshe traveling after that point at the lodging place in the desert. At the beginning of their journey, we did not hear anything more about his wife or his children being with him. We did not hear about them being in Egypt. It seems, says Shaddam, that Moshe at that point realized that he had made a mistake. He had erred in bringing his family along. On the one hand, a very natural and a very understandable course of action. On the other hand, it was a mistake because Moshe was not to be acting at this point in his life as any normal family man would act, as any husband would perhaps behave, he was now on a special mission, a task which was set by Hashem, and a task that he now understood he must fulfill, and if he did not, his firstborn son would die. He had no choice, and there was no place for his family in this mission. So he sent them back to Yithro. They had only left perhaps a day or two at the most before. He sent them back to his father-in-law's house and he made his own way to Misraim. And only after Yisriath Misraim, the Exodus, do we hear about Yithro returning to Moshe and meeting him in the desert with his wife and his children. From here we see how it is frequently the case that a great man with a great mission, which he knows that he must undertake, must disregard many of the usual inclinations and considerations of your average normal person. When a, a man is in such a position, he must even be willing to sacrifice his family, his wife and his children for this greater task, this greater good. Moshe knew and understood at this point that this is what he must do and this must come before all, all else. And thus he sent his family home and they were re reunited only some time later. We do not know exactly how much, how long later, but they were reunited only after Yisiat Misraim, after the Exodus. And here we see, once more, an essential characteristic and quality of a true Jewish leader. Moshe Rabbeinu is the ideal Jewish leader. He recognized that he had been chosen for a task, a very difficult and frankly almost impossible task. So it would have seemed to any person. He understood 
that this involved self-sacrifice and even beyond that it involved the sacrifice and inconvenience perhaps even suffering of his own family this he understood and he accepted because he understood and fully internalized that he had to fulfill the role that Hashem had entrusted to him once again we see the determination, the courage and the mesirut nefesh, the overarching willingness to do whatever is necessary to fulfill Hashem's will. Thank you, Rabbi Bar Chaim. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. We would also like to suggest the following opportunity to our viewers. If you identify with Rabbi Bar Chaim's message, and would like to sponsor or dedicate a video interview with the rabbi in honor or memory of a loved one. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.